pausing. Okay, I think we're up and going now. Uh, this is Taylor Sharp, and I'm here at the FileMaker Pro user group at the Harmonic Data Treehouse, and we're glad to be here. Uh, this is the Dallas chapter of the FileMaker Pro user group, and this is our monthly meeting, and we're glad to have all of you here. We've got uh, people here in real person, and we got uh, virtual people, so we're glad to have everyone here. Uh, real quickly, I'm going to start the screen share here. If my screen will come back, screen share. Okay, so we're back to screen, screen sharing here. There's our web page for those of you who don't know, fmpugdallas.com. This is where we uh, post our upcoming schedules. So as you can see here, today's May 6th. Uh, you get me today, Taylor Sharp. I'm going to uh, be doing the data viewer and debugger uh, are your friends presentation. Uh, FYI, Greg Price is online here. He and I are the chapter co-coordinators uh, that uh, organize these things. And we're always looking for good presentations. As you can see, we got a couple of good ones coming up here from Harmonic Data. June 3rd, we've got installing FileMaker server on the uh, Linux environment uh, with Fred. And that will be uh, certainly a, a fun and exciting one. I, I know I'll have a lot of... Oh, that's June, next month. Yeah. yeah, June 3rd. Yeah, you, you got to... Sure yeah, you should put that on the calendar, Fred. We're counting on you because <laughs> I'm sure we're going to have some good, <laughs> good questions. So... Uh, <laughs> And July 1st, if you haven't heard about Claris Studio, well, it's the big buzzword uh, out. It's the new software thing. And uh, um, I haven't played with it. Uh, uh, I hear it's going to be released to the wild very soon. So hopefully we will be learning some, uh, getting the introduction from Harmonic Data. I don't know who's going to give the presentation, but uh, I'm, uh, multiples. There we go. Steve says multiple ones will. So anyway, I'm sure it, it will be eye-opening. And obviously, I've got a lot to learn. And probably a number of you too. So it will be going to uh, bold new adventures. So uh, so August 5th is open. Uh, FYI on our webpage, you'll see most of these things we do uh, record and we put them out on YouTube. So if you uh, miss one of the meetings, you're more than welcome to go uh, watch it on YouTube. So that is, um, I think, uh, for announcements, I think everybody knows that we're not doing a developers conference this summer. Uh, so I guess the next one will be in 2023. But uh, for those of you who are uh, feeling missing out doing a conference, there is uh, the pause on air in October. Uh, I'm going to go to it. So uh, I went for my first time last year. So it was, uh, it's a smaller, much smaller version than the big one that uh, Claris puts on, but it's kind of a little more intimate and kind of personal. I, I enjoyed it. So anyway, uh, what? Uh, same place as last year in Georgia, um, kind of northeast Georgia. It's it's really not near anything, <laughs> but it's it's very nice and pleasant. So anyway, it's a, a retreat center. So anyway. Come join us if you if you got some if you we're going to spend some money on the budget on a, 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 a Claris Engage slash DevCom then put your budget towards something like that so or the other alternative is they do have several of them that are going on this summer uh, in Europe so okay. you can talk to boss and hey give me a free Europe trip you know? <laughs> <laughs> hey Taylor money on the budget you should know that you froze a little bit there. Yeah. yeah, please. Okay. Yeah, I said spend money on the budget, and then that's where we froze. Oh, we were. If you can talk to boss into sending you on a free cruise to uh, Europe for a FileMaker developers conference. So that's what we always say. So sorry about the pause. I'm sure your internet's doing something. There was a pause on error right there. Pa yeah, the pause on error got paused. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, that's our web page for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with it. And uh, like this, um, I'm going to start out with uh, we're talking about our topic is uh, the data and the data viewer. And so before we can really talk about that, we got to talk a little bit about uh, file made a hard line to him. Then uh, say that again. You're you keep freezing. You need like a hard line to you or something. Yeah. Fred's going to take a look. 
I got I'm we I'm are, Etherneted in. We are plugged in. Uh, Wi-Fi is off. Yeah. Wi-Fi is off. Wi-Fi is off. Um, so here we'll take a look at our network could it, could here. Could just be the rest of us here? That's a little bit. And turn off this limit IP track and maybe that'll help. <laughs> Some of these advanced uh, uh, Apple things. But anyway, we'll we'll make our way through. If I start pausing, just let me know and we'll figure it out. Okay, so back to where we were. We we got to in talking about the data data viewer. We got to talk about where that fits in uh, the FileMaker tools. So uh, first of all, um, I was trying to figure out where they came in. These tools belong to what uh, FileMaker traditionally called the advanced version of FileMaker. It was the version that. Uh, you used to have to pay extra for to give you additional development tools. And I was digging around, I was looking at the old FileMaker packaging here and trying to figure out when like FileMaker Advanced came in. Like for example, I knew it was back in 14. Was FileMaker Advanced, I don't see, pulling the room here. Anybody remember when FileMaker Advanced first came out? What version? Yeah. Right. Okay, so maybe all the way back to version three, there was some type of developer version of it. I know, um, gosh, I don't think I was doing anything. Well, I'm I would, thinking I like see. four. Was it really right. back then? Okay. Um, and I guess one of the questions is, of those advanced versions, when did uh, the data viewer and uh, debugger come in? Um, I was thinking no, I remember it. Not that started. early. Well, Mm. Debugger was 8.5, I think. Oh, no, I'm not the debugger. I'm, I'm not when you come out the, I thought you were talking about the same thing before. The yeah, de uh, debugger, I was trying to figure out that. Dennis would did know if anybody could. So, hey, Ben, it's seven. I was thinking I remember because I really didn't start doing scripting until seven. And then that's when we had the debugger before we had the data viewer. That I can tell you for sure. Ah, there's some, some interesting trivia I didn't know. Thank you, Dennis, there. So I'm, I'm sorry, Taylor, but that's where the gray cells start going black. <laughs> well, I do remember an interesting thing was FileMaker 7, we finally had variables. So uh, before that, we did we made all these global fields all over the place. That's how you could tell these old systems had freaking global mm -hmm. systems out the laws. I mean, global fields at the system that were very yucky. So um, anyway, uh, variables were quite improved. But uh, along with the advanced uh, functions, uh, we eventually did have a, a FileMaker uh, came out with the advanced version that has the uh, debugger and data viewer in it. And most recently, when we got to, well, we got up to FileMaker 18, which had an advanced, but when we got to FileMaker 19, um, this became Claris FileMaker Pro, and there is no advanced anymore. So what that means is that uh, everybody has the advanced tools if you have FileMaker Pro. You don't have to have an advanced version of it. So everybody has it. So uh, this is a tool that if you haven't used, uh, you certainly should want to use because you don't have to pay any extra for it. However, you do have to know how to turn it on. So if you want to turn it on here, you have to go to preferences up here and you're gonna to have to go down here where it says use advanced tools. I hope you guys can see that right down here. It's in your preferences under the general tab. You have to turn that on, click the checkbox, and guess what? Doesn't do anything then. You have to quit FileMaker and start it back up and then your tools will be there. So uh, what happens when you do that? Well, what you do is you now have a new column at the top of your menu bar called tools. And these are all the advanced tools that come when you turn on that system preference. So hopefully uh, you'll take advantage of that, turn that on and give this a try. Uh, I'm assuming most of you have already uh, know this very well, but this is for anybody who doesn't, but we're gonna do a little, little more talking about it. So um, I, make, uh, I basically live in these tools here. So I will say that I do have a lot of suggestions that uh, I would like to give Claris to improve upon them. And I think at the end of this discussion, we will talk about a bunch of those. And I'm sure I, I know Dennis and several of us have talked about things we would like to see in it, but we will get to the point where we will talk about that. But first we're gonna take a 
take a look at uh, how these tools work. So literally to turn the debugger on, you just come to tools and turn the debugger on. Here's the debugger, it's not doing anything. So uh, this debugger just sits there and it's a blank screen. So the question is, you know, how do you make it do anything? Uh, you will also notice at the top of mine, I have some go-tos and some searches and copy script text. Those are all from a plugin called Monkey Bread Software. You will not see those on yours unless you have that plugin. But I do find those useful because sometimes I like to copy the script and put it in plain text to email someone or things like that that you can't readily do in it. So anyway, uh, be aware that you will probably not see these up at the top, but uh, if you uh, get the Monkey Bread software plugin. Uh, Christian Smith's got a great little tool there for doing those kind of things. So anyway, but normally everything you'll see here is just going to be blank and it's ready to go. And so uh, the purpose of a debugger is think of it as a script trigger. It's uh, something that intercepts any time that FileMaker tries to run its business automation scripting uh, language. So uh, anytime the scripting language is, in, is invoked, this intercepts that uh, request and pulls it up on the screen here and lets you control stepping through and seeing what it's doing. So uh, if any of you did uh, uh, scripting before this, it was a real nightmare uh, to figure out when your script didn't work, why it didn't work. We had to go in there constantly and put show custom dialog box and have it pop up and show several values and then continue and another pop up. And so you were, <laughs> manually debugging with show custom dialog boxes is a real pain in the petite. And <laughs> but but uh, those, those of us in the old school, we didn't know any better. In fact, actually, you know, until FileMaker 7, I didn't even do scripting. And so uh, I hadn't even been sold into the uh, business automation side of FileMaker. So, uh, and, you know, now I live in it. It is the strongest component to me of FileMaker. But at the, at the time I wasn't doing it. And so, uh, and of course, uh, you know, like all of us, we, our first handful of scripts, we, we all make, you know, one, two, three line scripts and we think we're scripting. So, you know, good place to start. But <laughs> <laughs> so, but just to give some examples here is uh, if you were to, for example, run a script, if you go up to somewhere up here, um, I'll turn on the scripting here and say, try to run a script. So I'm, I'm first of all, assuming if you're in this discussion that you recognize uh, this is your script workspace and this isn't about writing scripts. This is just about debugging. And so I have to say, if you're not familiar with the writing scripts, this, uh, we won't have time to go through that, but this is where you write the scripts and uh, edit them and then you can uh, do a number of things with it. But uh, from here, you can also tell it uh, to run. And so um, I am going to go up here and run a script. And when it starts running, instead of running, this uh, pops up here, this script debugger here, and it goes right down to, uh, it shows the script as you see it in the script workspace. And it goes to the line. The line it's at is going to be highlighted in this green right here. This is important. Green on the left. And it tells you what line number you're on. Uh, and we have all these line numbers on the left. That really sounds great until you realize there's a bug in it that hides a lot of them as you move further down. But um, uh, the, uh, This tells you our place and what it's about to do. So when we're on this green thing here, we, we can see the next thing it's going to do is set a variable called dollar $SP to equal the get script parameter. So how do we make this function? So all our controls are up at the top of the debugger. So everything you can do is up at the top of the debugger. Down at the bottom is the call stack. And then our little pause on error. And we will get to all of those later. But most everything we're going to do is right up here at the top. So First of all, I'm just going to start from the left to right to tell what we have up here. This first thing here, if you hold your mouse over, it says edit script. Okay, a lot of times when we are debugging, we want to edit the script to make a change because in the debugging, we find out something went wrong. You can always go up to, you know, scripts and, you know, your script workspace and open it up. But this is a quick, easy way to uh, immediately edit a script. So you click this button and uh, behind the script debugger, 
will show up this uh, your actual script. So this is really useful if you have like multiple monitors or a big screen to move things around. Uh, the script debugger will always be in front of it. However, uh, you can make changes in the script uh, live while it's, uh, you know, the script is running here, you can make changes, but these changes don't affect what's running. So, but you can make changes, you just can't save the changes. When you save the changes, it will ask to uh, interrupt your script. But it lets you basically see, I'm looking over here on the right, I can see what I'm doing here and say, I click this SP and it uh, doesn't do what I wanted. I can come over here in my uh, script editor and I can come right here and I can go in and edit this uh, function or script uh, parameter or whatever I wanted to do right here live. So it's very useful to have this little edit button to pop open that script. And one thing that is convenient about it that I do like is when you press this button here, it tries to open this script and it will try to go to the line that you are at. It usually puts it right down at the bottom. I kind of wish it would put it in the middle, but you know, user interface complaints, but <laughs> Anyway, it, it is nice, uh, you know, if you got short scripts, that's no problem. But sometimes some of us write really long scripts and then it, it gets more useful there. So, but anyway, that, that is our edit thing. You can also uh, close things. I will give you an example of if I try to make a change, like I'm gonna add a space at the end here. So we now have changed our script. If I try to uh, uh, save the script, uh, it will balk at me and say, this script is running. So if I hit save, it'll save the change, but it'll also stop my script from running. So um, I'll say no, and uh, I'll actually go back to scripts and I'll just revert, revert it back to where we were at. Okay, while I'm at this, on the left buttons, this edit script is actually not the farthest left button. The next but, uh, farthest left button is actually this red button up here. Okay. So the red button means close window. But what does that really mean? <laughs> means you forgot to stop the script first. It, it basically <laughs> means close the debugger, but it also means run. So where you are in this script, it immediately, if you close this, takes off running. I wish they would change the user interface to ask that because I run into that all the time where if I hit this, I'm expecting to close and quit. No, that means close and run. So uh, that is something that I think I, every developer I've talked to has griped about. Yes, I hit the close window and my script took off running and I was like, stop, stop, stop. So anyway, be, be wary about that. Uh, of course, the green button makes it go to full screen, uh, but Anyway, that's the only big caveat in the, the top left there. So uh, if you want to quit it the correct way, we will get to the next button how, on how to stop. <laughs> Taylor? Yes, Taylor. sir. You should mention that's especially important if you're doing cross-platform work because on Windows, the buttons for closing are over on the right. The stop button is where you see it here, but it's a big red X, so it looks a little different in Windows. Yes, certainly does, certainly does. Things to keep in mind when you're doing the cross-platform thing. Most of my clients are Windows people, but I'm a Mac person, so anyway. Diversity. <laughs> okay, so keep that in mind when you're looking at uh, cross-platform stuff. But Okay, so we're gonna keep moving along. The next button right here is run. This is our continue, excuse me. That's what uh, FileMaker comes in. Uh, you will also notice that there are, if you have keyboard shortcuts, you can use the option F8 to make things run too. If you have a keyboard that has that. All of these, um, if you hold your mouse over them, you see the, uh, the little toggle popover thing that tells you um, uh, what the shortcuts are. And, um, and I like the shortcuts a lot, but some people don't. Anyway move your mouse over it, you click this, and this means continue. So when it says continue, it doesn't go to the next line. It keeps on running. It'll run through the whole script. That isn't a, you know, go to the next line. We will get to that next. So this means run the script from where you, wherever the green is, 
means it's going to take off running forward and do everything from there forward. So, okay. Now, the next script uh, button up here, I mean, this uh, debugger button is called the halt script. So that means stop, pause, don't, well, actually, it actually halts it. And uh, so if you push this, it actually exits out the script. It's not running anymore. So it's the same thing as in the scripting, if you were writing a halt uh, script step, it doesn't just exit, it actually closes the whole thing and it absolutely stops running. So um, th there, there's a time that's useful for that. Uh, but um, I'm gonna come back here. And... Here. We're back in here and we're running. Um, I will also tell you that in between these two, if you're running a long script that takes a long time to run, there is a pause button, which will be two bars, and we'll show that later on that will come up uh, in between those two. And uh, is it to the right of it or in between the two? Of it? Anyway, but there's a, a pause button will come up that if you are running a long script and you want to pause it, you don't want to actually halt it because if you halt it, you, till you, you, you completely stop out. But if you hit the pause, it will stop at whatever script step it's at and just pause there uh, to, for you to tell it what to do next. And that can be very useful if you're running some long looping import or, or a very long script. So uh, you can always hit that pause while it is running uh, conversely, you can also hit escape and I think command period and other things that we desperately do to tell it to stop something when we don't want it to, to run. But uh, <laughs> Dennis, what do you want? Well, what I want to say about that is that the pause button doesn't necessarily work. Uh, if you've written some kind of a loop and Prowlmaker is processing what's in that loop. And if the loop doesn't have any pause steps in it, you can click that pause button all day long and just pray that it will catch it and actually pause. Uh, what it does is it pauses when it goes to the next step. So for example, if you have a set variable that is doing a, a big loop in it with a while or something, it's not going to interrupt that. It'll, it'll interrupt the next pause that it gets on it uh, and it's not always immediately when you think it is. It, I think it has something to do with, you know, we'll get to the uh, data viewer soon, but it's uh, like when the data viewer is refreshed, you know, there are certain times when it can pause, but it basically pauses after a step uh, that it's running. And so if you have one step, for example, like an import or something that is going to be a real long running in the middle of a step, it doesn't know how to do that. Also, you should mention that the run button will run until it hits a breakpoint, like the one you've got in line 19. Yep, yep, we're gonna do that next. Uh, by the way, I did have one uh, observation here. Uh, this uh, run button, that pause button I was telling you about, actually uh, this uh, continue button turns into the pause button. That's what it is. It becomes the two little uh, hash bars up and down. And so it toggles between run and, and pause. So that, that's where you'll see it when it's running. So, okay, so we've got continue, we got uh, halt. And I guess uh, since Dennis has brought it up, we can also say, you know, what is it gonna run to? You know, how does it know when to run? Well, obviously if you get to the end of a script, it stops running. Um, or, or at any point in the script where you have an exit script, it'll finish running. But one thing that is uh, useful is, um, you see we have these blue stoppers, uh, stop markers right here. Those mean wherever you're running, run until you get to that stop mark. So if I put a stop right here and I hit run, it's gonna run from this green, it's gonna do all of these steps, and then it's gonna stop without executing that script step, it's gonna stop at that script step. Script step. So if I click go there, oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, it, it must have exited. I, <laughs> da, da, da. So if we're here, which I'll explain what I did 
if I click this, it's not gonna, uh, it's gonna go right to uh, the 15. It skipped right over 14, it didn't stop. And you can go way down in a script line, it'll go, go all the way till it runs to one of those. Those can be very uh, useful to, if you're debugging a problem and you know where your problem is, you tell it to stop before it gets to the problem. And that way you can then, you don't have to go through every little line on your way up to it. So these little toggles off and on of these uh, um, uh, blue lines is very useful for stopping. It will always pause the uh, data viewer, I mean, the debugger when you're using it. Um, the other Taylor, thing, yeah? sometimes, sometimes when you've got a script that's kind of run away, right? If, you're, if your debug screen is still open, that's if you can't get the pause going, sometimes you can set one of those stop points. Um, it's hit or miss, but, but sometimes I've been able to get one of those to set when I can't get the pause to pause. I'm able to get one of those to set in oh, order to get- Especially it, in the loop. Insert a, to insert a stop point to get it to stop when you write, when like a loop is running. Yeah, okay. I learned something. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> you, you gotta be quick and you gotta be persistent. Yeah. You know, just keep <laughs> <laughs> uh, You also have to be careful not to turn it off, on, off, on, off, on, because I've done that too, so. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing happens when you're trying to pause it. If you click and you don't see the button change and you click again, when it finally gets to doing it, it then does it and it immediately undoes it because it's buffering the number of times you click. You do have to be careful about that. Yeah. True. Certainly, certainly. Yes, it, it tends to remember things and uh, uh, yeah. You also have to be careful if you have dialogues built in because it'll, like you said, the buffering of your clicks, it'll, right. it might, you might have caused yourself to skip past some things you meant to stop at. What, when I encounter what you described, Heather, what I've done is I've not tried to click on the same breakpoint line every time. I'll click on a few of them oh, in that right. general region and hope that one of them gets caught. Yeah, kind of kind of bounced around. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. The key word is hope. You, you, um, try, you try different things until something works. Uh, you yeah. get desperate. And one of the most important things is don't be overconfident in your code so that you don't debug it first before you just hit run. <laughs> oh, and yeah. hey, my scripts always work on the first try. Right. Absolutely, every time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, for those of you who don't know, generally we debug our script first before we actually tell it just to run. And it is a very benefit to, to be able to, uh, to use this tool for that. Okay. So uh, as we're moving through a script though, uh, one of the things that we might want to do is we've got a, a series of buttons here that we're gonna take a look at. Uh, the first one is gonna be the step over button. And the next one's gonna be the step into. And then we're gonna step out, which I think of as a step up, but step out. And then the set next uh, step. Uh, first of all, um, what the step over means is this one and the step into are very similar. The difference is uh, if this is going into, for example, it's calling a uh, subscript, in other words, a perform script, it will step into that. Uh, uh, if you do the step over script, it will just run that whole script. If you do a step uh, into, it will actually go into that script and you will be debugging a subscript. And you will see that down in your call stack here, you will have one script here and then your call stack will then have another script under it. So if you're in uh, the first script and there's a, and you say, uh, use a script step of perform script or uh, you would then be able to step into that and see what happens. Uh, it won't work on things like perform script on server though. So it only works on perform script. So are there any other steps that works on this step over? Is it just perform script? I think it's just perform well, script. I have a question. Uh huh. Um, <clears throat> you said before that when you click that square button, <laughs> it the script. 
Yeah. Um, is it true that it actually also uh, clears everything in the call stack or just the script you're debugging? It clears the call stack. Everything? Yep. You sure about that? Yep. Okay. I, I've not liked it doing that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it, hence my wanting to do the pause, but yes. <laughs> yeah, the only way around that is to set the next point, like at the bottom of the script you're on, so it'll step out of it and right. get back to the one you were on. Yes, uh, and that does bring up another thing kind of along the best practices end of things. Uh, uh, kind of like it, uh, most of us put some type of uh, notation at the top of your script, uh, you should always be kind of explaining what you're doing. Uh, I always like to have uh, uh, at the end of the script, uh, best uh, computer hygiene is to have an exit script or a halt script, but probably an exit script. And it is particularly useful uh, in uh, the debugger because if your second to last script step is something like set a variable, well, you can set it, but then if that's the last script step, the script ends and you don't get to see what it was set to. So if you have an exit script after that, then you always know that you won't uh, you know, be bailing out on your last script step because you know you, have a, you won't bail out until you get to the exit script. So I always have a habit of making sure all my scripts have an exit script down at the bottom because it also helps out on debugging uh, and sometimes if I'm doing a bunch of debugging, I put the blue thing on it to make sure it goes through, it stops at the exit script so I can see the uh, status of all my uh, data at that point before it, it, it exits uh, my debugging. So. so one thing to mention for those who may not know is that when you use the skip over, you know, the hop over step, it will still stop if you've got one of those stop points in the script that you're hopping over. Yes, that is something that's important to know. Uh, the, um, where those, uh, those stop things are in essence stored in the script workspace and remembered. And so when you run them, it doesn't matter where you, uh, um, where they are, if you run them, it, it's gonna, you know, they are remembered every time. So if you do a, 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 a you know, step over, and there's a stop, you know, one of those blue things in there, it's gonna stop at that point and you're gonna be in the subscript. Which yeah. is interesting well, because you can add one of those while the script is running. But if you select edit and add one of those, you cannot save that in the script without having to exit the running script but you can add it while running the script and script debugger without saving the script and yet it is saved in the script. Does that seem like an inconsistency? Those uh, things that Taylor is calling blue things uh, mm -hmm. are known as breakpoints. Just Yeah, so the breakpoints can be added and saved and there while running it, but they can't be saved without saving it and having to exit the script maker. That That's seems right. like an inconsistency to me. But if a breakpoint is located inside something like what Taylor was doing before, if it's inside uh, an if statement and the if isn't satisfied, it'll just go past that breakpoint. Correct. So putting a, a breakpoint inside an, an if or any other condition might cause it to just be overlooked. Certainly, but my point is that the condition where you have to exit the script maker, that, that, I mean, sorry, that's not script maker, the debugger itself, because you have edited the script, doesn't apply if that edit to the script occurred within the debugger itself. That's right. There's an interesting tension that uh, FileMaker had to do here because you can have the script open at the same time and the debugger. And when you're clicking the blue buttons in the debugger, it's in essence trying to save a value in the, uh, in the layout, I mean, excuse me, in the script. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, uh, the problem is if you have your script workspace closed, it's not an issue. It'll, it'll save it there and it works just fine. The, the, most of us though have the script workspace open because we're wanting to edit on it. So the problem is if you've already done an edit in it, you've kind of you know, frozen it as yes, I've taken control of that document. And then the, the blue things, when you click on them, 
get remembered or don't remember depending on if it's able to make that save over to the workspace. And if you've been editing in the workspace, it can't, it can't remember it. Um, right. So anyway, it's just, it, it's kind of a record locking issue. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to add, Taylor, is that when you were describing the difference between those first two uh, arrow buttons, the step into and the step over, whatever they're called, um, I found that they behave identically unless the script step is a performed script. Yes. Because there's nothing to step into other than a performed script step. Right, right. And, and that's why I was asking the question if there's any other script step that I could think of that it could step into that I was not aware of. And I was feeling like I might stick my foot in my mouth because there's probably some obvious one. And <laughs> 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 I mean, personally, I've always used the first button when I want to just advance one step at a time. And then I'll only use the step into if there's a reason to step into the subscript. But if I just want to execute the subscript, then the first button just does it. Ah, well, I do it the other way just to be the opposite of a dentist. I noticed that. <laughs> anyway, they both basically work the same, except for if you hit a perform script. So yes, you can, you can hit either of them and you're, you're going to do just fine. Now, one thing that is convenient, though, is if you step into a subscript, okay, so you go to one of the, you know, you're at a perform script and you step into one, one way to get out of that or to, you know, they call it here is the step out of, but really to me, it means because I'm thinking the call stack down here, if you've now stepped into a subscript, if you click this, if you're in the subscript, it will run through that script and shy of running into a blue breakpoint, um, it will go up to the next call stack script, hence the arrow up. So even though they say out, I think up, because you think in your call stack down here, here's your first script and then here's your subscripts. So when you click this one here, it will run until it either hits a blue spot uh, a breakpoint, or it'll go up to the script above it and stop at that script step that uh, it's at that it was called from. So it won't continue. It'll just go up to the next uh, uh, script. And so that can be very useful if you called a subscript that is going to be a really long one or something that had a lot of script steps and you didn't want to have to step, step through, step, step, step. It's especially helpful if you're in an environment where there are a lot of script triggers. Right. So if you have a script trigger, uh, if you've got a layout that has mode change script triggers and you've entered find mode and then you perform to find and you entered browse mode and all kinds of things happen like navigation happens and on record load happens and you don't care about those things because that's not what you're trying to debug um you want to you want to get yourself bumped out of those as quickly as possible yep but that's an important thing that heather's saying is as you say, like, go to a layout, if you have on layout load script trigger, that script trigger is going to pop up as a subscript right here. It will, uh, mm -hmm. it will intercept this, uh, whatever script step, you know, script you're running right now and run that script trigger. So you will now be in another uh, step lower in the call stack and you will be running that script trigger. So the script debugger respects all those script triggers. Uh, but sometimes it's a real pain in the butt to, you know. <laughs> you know. I've noticed that there are times when the script debugger is open and a script trigger executes without presenting itself in the debugger. And I haven't figured out what things are exceptions to showing up in the debugger. Describe what you're talking about. What do you mean? Um, I don't have a good example in my head, but I'll just see if I can think. Let's say I have um, a script trigger on layout enter and the mm -hmm. script trigger is open and I go to that layout, the script debugger will intercept and show me the running of that triggered script. But mm -hmm. there are other times when it doesn't catch it. I think and the I only time that I've seen is if you are, if you have like only like a one line script where it didn't, where or something like that, where sometimes it doesn't have a chance to to, to uh, stop. But even that, um, uh, 
I think it may only be certain, like certain types of those or something. Because I've run into it, but very rarely. The next time it happens, Heather, I'll I'll try to make a note of that and see yeah. what. I'd like to see that. There are different kinds. There, there are different kinds of script triggers, you know. There, there's yeah. uh, the ones that are attached to a layout, and then there are some others that are attached to a field. Mm -hmm. Like or, the on keystroke triggers. Oh yeah, that, that, like that would be something I might imagine. That yeah. would be. <laughs> but it's one thing I do like about the the debug is because you know we tend to think about the scripts that we wrote, and we're not always thinking about the scripts that someone else wrote. Or that's that someone else might be us, but in another context that we're encountering along the way, you know, along the path that our script is passing through along the way. And so while our script is running and it is skipping along past, <laughs> you know, and, and bumping into something else that's right. also happening at the same time or in the middle of, and maybe it's changing the context um, of, you know, what we're running and, you know, other things can be happening that, that have nothing to do with the script that we wrote that was of course, perfect. Yeah, okay, of course. well. And what Taylor said heard. before about comments that we've passed on to Claris to request improvements. One of them is that in your list of layouts, um, you're able to see the uh, menu set, for example, that's attached to that layout, but they don't show you the script triggers that might be on that layout. So if you're yeah. writing a script and you don't remember that there is a script trigger on layout enter and you're going to perform some you know, uh, maintenance function that needs to get to the records in that table, it's really, really helpful to make sure you have a layout that hasn't got any script triggers on it at all. Mm -hmm. the same uh, context, perhaps. FYI, as long as we're on this topic, um, <laughs> this button right here is the disable and enable script triggers. So if you want to turn off the script triggers so that they don't automatically happen, uh, you can turn this off and on. Uh, so that you can control that behavior if script triggers run or don't run. So just- But you can't control that as a script step. In other words, there's no script step similar to allow user abort that would say disable triggers so that you could run your script with no triggers. I start with almost all my triggers with a check to see if, if triggers are active. Um, just a global variable or global setting. Um, that way, I can turn them off at any point in a script that for this script, I don't want triggers to run. And it goes through and does the thing. And then I turn, make sure you toggle it back on again. How do you uh, do that? With a button right here in the top, top of no, my, my no, 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 global setting. Oh, I just, well. I say right there, right at the very beginning of, of the script, I say, if uh, not, uh, I forgot, I forgot what I use. Well, um, this is what I use. I use dollar dollar running. If this is true, then exit the script. Otherwise, go on. So I yeah. I, I think I think oh well, I have triggers active tr triggers on. Uh, you know, if not triggers active, then um, you know it it ex it exits right away. Right. And so I'm, at the beginning of the script, like you did here. I, yeah, I'm doing. I just instead of you know, active, trigger active, I'm, I call it running. So that basically if I'm running a subscript and I don't want it to do the things, I turn on a global variable, uh, dollar dollar running is my little thing um, uh, that says bail out if it hits that, don't run whatever the script trigger thing is on it. So, yep, very useful, very useful. Um, You're setting that global variable as part of your triggered script. Well, no, no you other said it script. as you said it in the in the in the parent script that you do not want to trigger the script. The, That's the, what I meant. That, that, yeah. that parent thing is the triggered script. No, the triggered script would be the, the script that is triggered by the script trigger. Okay. Would be the right triggering right. script, you know, would be your your parent script. Okay. But regardless, yeah, you set it there. That way you can just automatically skip over all all of them. For example, things that are, a lot of my script triggers are just for display purposes, you know, to, to set certain tabs or, or something like that. And I don't want to bother doing that. It's just going to slow things down if I'm 
running through something. Of course, then again, best practice, have a series of blank layouts for all, for one, for every one of your um, um, tables. I put the word processing dot, dot, dot on it. And um, then always go to those to do any kind of function because it's going to be faster anyways. And right. you won't have to worry about script errors. Okay. Moving along here, this script step right up here, the set next step was the last one that I learned. And it would have been really helpful if I had known that years before. I can't believe I went so long without knowing this script step. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I actually learned it from Kirk Bowman at this user group way back a dozen, 15 years ago or something. I don't know, um, uh, uh, you know, what it does. But basically, uh, as you can see, uh, the green spot where that shows that where our focus is right now, I can move that somewhere else. If I click on this line 13 and I click up here, I've now moved the spot where the next uh, uh, line is going to run just by clicking this. And that way I can move around and skip over a bunch of things and go right down to wherever my problem is <coughs> and try to figure out you know, what's happening or try to make something happen. So this is a very useful, uh, function, the uh, set next step uh, to change the focus of where you want to run next within a script, particularly if you want to skip over a bunch of things on it. So uh, certainly make uh, good use of that. Um, we already discussed the enabling, disabling script triggers. And then the <coughs> far right button here is the open data viewer. So we're going to go take a look here at our data viewer. Data viewer goes hand in hand with the uh, script debugger. Um, trying out here. Um, so here's our data viewer. And at the top, we have uh, two buttons here, <coughs> current and watch. Current uh, really just is exactly what it says. It says, what are all the current values as we're running right now? including if we're running a script, it's gonna show you a lot of the fields that we're uh, working on. In this case here, I got a <coughs> super simple database. Usually you're gonna see a whole thing of, um, um, of fields. So this is unusual to only see just a couple of fields at the top, but it also will show you your variables, in this case, dollar, dollar image or any of the dollars that will all be in place here. So that's very useful uh, to, as you're stepping through scripts to figure out what the values are and see if they're as you expected. Uh, you can also double click on them if you wanna open them big to see all of the data that's in a variable, or you can also just <coughs> hover over it and... <coughs> Takes a second for big data. Yeah, I got a lot of data in there, it's an image. Go to the first one. Go to your primary key. Well, that'll just show one. Others were, yeah. This one just, there's only one in it, so it comes back. So it's convenient to hold over, particularly if you have something that's got uh, a lot of lines in it and you want to see it. It's just, the more you get into the world of JSON, it becomes more useful to be able to hover over and see, see that because it tends to be multi-line. Uh, whereas in the past, we used to just have one piece of data in most of our variables. <clears throat> Can I add something about that? Sure. Um, what I find, and I didn't learn this until many years had gone by, that if the script is paused and you've got a global variable set, like in your case, I don't think you could use the one for the primary key because that's in a field, but the one for your image, you can edit that. Yep. And it will then allow the script to be aware of whatever new value you've put in for that global variable. And this may just change. Right. Now, if you try to edit it and it's over the maximum allowed with 30,000 or whatever it is, then it won't allow you to add, right. to type in a character. But oh, that, that annoys me so much. I wonder yeah. when they're going to change that. <clears throat> An example of where you might find that useful is. Um, uh, I am a, um, one of the security accounts 
in my client's database. So when I log in, get account name is me. Uh, and if the script is doing anything that relies on the account name, it probably doesn't do me any good to have myself be the account if the script is dependent on it being one of the typical employee users of that database. So I can stop at that point and where there's a global variable that's showing the account name, I can change it to someone else's name and then the, the debugging will make more sense. Certainly, certainly, yes. It is very useful to be able to edit as you're going uh, and make a change uh, to see what will happen while you're uh, in the middle of debugging. The script. Right. Another example might be a date. If there's a script step that's uh, running based on get current date, but you want to see what happened the day before yesterday, uh, after you've set the global variable for today's date, you can go in and change it to a different date where you then might get records that you're expecting to get from a, a find step. Yes, that, that is all very true. So this is a very uh, useful, the current side of things to watch is very useful. Uh, I'm going to give some caveats. Uh, FileMaker does not let you decide what fields it wants to show. It basically looks at the layout you're at and throws all of those fields uh, up on here uh, and also throws some others that are dependent upon it that generally sounds fine until you start doing things uh, like having fields that have large summaries or large lists. You can, uh, if those fields are having to do massive calculations uh, as you're stepping through your scripts, it will almost render this useless because you, you know, every time you script step, it'll, you know, take a minute or two or even longer to go to the next script step as it tries to recalculate everything you have in here. So for example, I like to do a lot of JSON stuff. And if you got a lot of long JSON in there, that'll slow things down. But uh, probably the thing that kills most is if you have a primary key field and you have a list of that primary key field, uh, we use that a lot for reporting and things like that. And you have show all records and you have you know, a few hundred thousand records, killed your debugger, you know, <laughs> you, you basically have to force quit and come back to it. Uh, what you can do is go over to watch. And this is in the watch, you can specify what uh, fields are variables you want to see. And only these fields are being refreshed. So a lot of times things will go a lot <coughs> uh, faster if you uh, limit to say, hey, uh, instead of showing all of these over here, I, all I wanted to see was you know, dollar, dollar, why is it not typing? Dollar, dollar image. <coughs> See, I'm now in the watch and I'm, uh, this view only <coughs> is gonna display the ones that I've asked to see or the fields I've asked to see. So that's a variable, but I could say, show me the field too. Here's a field, you know, created by. So uh, you can choose what you wanna see and only what you see, and that can be a lot more useful, uh, particularly if you're running into the, the beach ball from uh, your current showing, you know, uh, <laughs> basically bringing everything to almost a halt. <laughs> and one thing that's an awesome feature that comes with this one is it's sort of turns in the caches, which it never does, <laughs> or you have to force quit to move everything in your watch. Yes, yes. So everything in your watch gets cleared out if you if you get have to force quit. So yes, it would be nice if it would remember some of those. There, 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 there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's a safety because you know if you're crashing the debugger because of things that you have in your debugger, <clears throat> which I have done on multiple occasions, um, then it's just going to crash again if it remembered what you had in there. You're going to talk about the lock icon? Um, lock icon. Um, that one. Right there? Yeah. If you're, let's say, logged into a system with a privilege set other than full access, mm -hmm. and you happen to have your advanced tools turned on in your preferences, then when you open the data viewer, 
it will require you to authenticate yourself with a full access account so that you can then stay in the script with the uh, limited privilege set of your user that you're trying to debug, but you can have the data viewer report to you. Yes, very, very useful for testing out uh, users with limited privileges to make sure they're able to do the job functions uh, that they need to be. Yes, <clears throat> that it's very useful for that. So, uh, <clears throat> but also the nice thing about the data viewer is it's really, you have the calculation engine available to you now. You can do anything that you can do in the calculation engine and get a result right here. Uh, you know, anything that you want to do, you can test uh, calculations, um, you know, it kind of uh, in here in the data viewer. And once you uh, test them, then uh, you can, uh, you know, well, I mean, it's what you test them so that you before you actually go into your dat managed database to put it in the, the calculation field that you're going to work on. And that way you can make sure, at least within the context, now, of course, it's based on the context of whatever layout you're in, but you can uh, test out your formulas ahead of time before you go store them in a calculation field, particularly for those of us that uh, want to work on live databases. Of course, every out there says you should never ever do that and we all end up doing it anyway but uh, <laughs> but if you could at least go test it first in the data viewer before you go in the managed database and spend as little time as you can in the managed database the file maker tends to be a little happier with us working on live databases even though that is certainly not a best practice but anyway hey, just and to point what, what is what monkey, i saw i'm oh, sorry go ahead what is monkey bread saying to you in the upper right corner uh, L1C25. The position uh, of the cursor. Yeah, position of the cursor, see. Oh, yeah. is that a line, line one cursor 24? Is that what that yeah. I'm on line one and I'm on the 18th uh, character over on, on this right here. Got it, thank you. Um, so a plug for what, <clears throat> I saw you have the, the Tune Power FM toolbox. Um, Mm -hmm. With that, you actually can do it. You don't even have to leave the um, defined database if you're making changes and such, or in a script. If you if your cursor is in a calculation dialog box, you can hit the evaluate oh, button in the bottom left of that, and it will evaluate it in, in place, and you can see what it will produce without having to leave. So, <clears throat> and saying that's for developer assistant. Uh, yeah. Yes, I love developer assistant. If you don't have that, you should look at it. We don't have time to go over it today, but it is, <laughs> it should be built into Claris. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> okay. A uh, couple of buttons down here. We have the automatically evaluate versus manually evaluate. Uh, the advantage is, as, um, you know, as I'm going along here and adding things, it's not evaluating and it evaluates here. Whereas if I turn this on and it's evaluating as I go along. Uh, and so you can see live things evaluating. It's, there you go. it feels nice to be in live. Uh, oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Are you hearing me? Yeah, we lost yeah. you for a minute. Okay. Just for a, just for a few moments. When you click to automatically evaluate, that's when it froze. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it, it evaluated me and didn't like that. We'll turn that off then. <laughs> but be aware that if you have, for example, a long SQL call or a big while going, you might want to turn that off and only turn it on as you're doing things um, uh, if, uh, if performance is an issue. Uh, a couple of other things that I'll mention while we're here is when you're in the data viewer, I was used to writing long single line formulas for everything that makes one calculation. But if you, hopefully all of, a lot of you are familiar with the let function. The big advantage of the let function is uh, you can um, do a bunch of things. Um, uh, you can have in essence a bunch of uh, steps along the way. Uh, And if you're in the data viewer, the nice thing about it is uh, you can, uh, I'll turn it on to automatically evaluate. Um, you can 
if you're using the let function, you can look at your calculation uh, kind of piecemeal. So I can see, am I getting the right ID? Is my uh, C1 field what I was expecting? Is my C2 field what, is, what I was expecting? So one thing that's really nice that uh, I wasn't a big user of let until I started using the data viewer. And the data viewer, basically, when I would have a formula that involves a lot of things in it, it would let me uh, then... Um, uh, what is this over here? Siri, go. Siri's re is Siri, stop that. Siri. Describing everything. <laughs> <you're saying. laughs> Captioning for the hearing impaired. Who, who invited Siri to this meeting? <laughs> yes, you can also set variables too uh, with the let statement. So with an evaluate and a let statement, that can be extremely useful if you want to set something on the fly. You have to know your uh, using the text, uh, using the let function in, and evaluate, you can evaluate text string. So you can write a let that gets, uh, it, that evaluates the. Oh, okay. I, I was thinking dynamically, but yes, you can uh, set, uh, you know. But I mean, you know, dollar D is now dog, but also within the script, uh, you know, it, it would, you know, be able to set on that, or you can, you know, dollar D if you want to keep it. Mm. But, um, but I also, uh, I guess I was thinking about the evaluate so you can dynamically set uh, variables too. But anyway, that's kind of a whole nother spinoff. We don't have time to do that. So we're kind of actually running out of time here. Um, Basically, uh, we are kind of, well, obviously I'll, I'll mention that you can turn your um, uh, wings off and on here. These wings let you see all your calculation functions if you need some help for putting them in. Uh, if you want to, you know, put whatever function in and all those things can do just like everywhere else that the calculation exists. Your fields are over on your left and your um, tables are up there on the, in the top left. So. Um, can I make a comment? Sure, Dennis. Yeah, what I absolutely hate about um, this automatically evaluate feature in the data viewer is that you can't stop uh, something that's taking a long time where you weren't really wanting it to automatically evaluate, but you forgot that you had that option checked. Um, It'd be nice to have an abort button, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would help to have an abort button. An example that happens to me all the time due to my own negligence is that I'm writing uh, something that has a let function and in the end of it there's an execute SQL and the select statement is calling for let's say a certain field from a certain table and I intended to type a where uh, after that but before I get to type it it's already giving me uh, 10,000 records from a table that I didn't need yet. Yeah, that, that, those things certainly happen. Uh, I would really like if they also had the, a checkbox on the left to be able to turn off and on. Like if I if it automatically sticks a field up here that's a you know a list field, I can you know turn it off to not keep calculating it. I would like that. I would also like to have a button in between the current and watch that just says show me variables. Don't show me fields. Just show me all my variables. And that way, uh, it, uh, I would see all my variables, but I wouldn't have. That to would be them. wonderful. Right. I would love that. Right. So Did anyway, you mention the add to watch button. Well, I mean, you could do a button here that says plus, you know, show me all my variables. But I was just thinking the button in between that just says variables and it only shows your variables. Right. You the variables. Actually, right. I'd love a custom function. If I could get a custom function that would give me all the active variables, that would be wonderful. Uh, See if I would love a script that, that would give me the, the active variables. That would be really useful. Select one of your, one of your um, items there. And now in the bottom left, you can click add to watch. And that's just a handy quick way of getting it into the watch list. Yep. Yeah. There it is. Yep, so, yep that, that can be very useful. Uh, I guess we didn't cover the pluses and minuses and duplicates, but you can add, uh, add additional, this is where you can add additional things to your uh, watch. You can duplicate one, you can edit one, but usually I just double click on it. 
And then you can also delete one, make it go away. I use the duplicate a lot when I'm creating variations of very complicated things. I use the data viewer all the time for building complex calculations, um, building JSON, complicated mm -hmm. JSON. I never go, I never go right into defined fields and, you know, just start building a complex calculation anymore. I mean, yeah. why waste the time with the trial and error right. when you can test out, make sure that the results are going to be accurate before you go in, particularly if you've got tables that have, you know, millions of records in them. Every, t I mean. <laughs> the, the, the only difference, um, Heather, is that if you use the data viewer to initially write your expression mm -hmm. and then you want to copy and paste and put it into your field yes, definition. There, there is a difference that they have, have to be fully, sure yeah, you your field have to be fully filled out. Everything in the data yeah. viewer, whereas in the in managed database, you can assume context. Yes, that, that's true. So making changes, if you're copying something from a field definition and putting it into the data viewer, you've got to add that context back in. So right. that's, you know, that's a little annoying, but, you know, I can live with that oh, for the what hey. I get out of the data viewer. Taylor, yeah. Taylor hey. show them the magic from Monkey Bread. You have it on, on yours? On the data viewer? Oh, the oh the magic add or remove. No, go ahead and click on that like the one you have there, the expression. Uh down the bottom right there. TO plus and minus on the right hand side. It adds the it adds or removes the, the current you're adding it over and over. Oh, I see. <laughs> so it only adds it to, if you have like a field there. And then and then it. So like, yeah, you do that and then do remove. And now you can do add. Oh, that's nice. That's handy. And well, what about the nice. check mark and the uh, the arrow buttons? What do they do? Um, I don't remember. Can... Oh, that one is validating them. Yeah. I don't remember what the other one is. It tells me that syntax is OK here. And the other one is, what is that? It, oh, it just kind of runs it, even if I guess it's kind of like evaluate, but I don't know, yeah, I don't know why that one does this and evaluate. But I use the TO ones, so yep, yep, that is nice. Yeah, I there's so much I don't know about Monkey Bread software. I think there were what, five, six thousand functions in it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's just the built in stuff that they changed in FileMaker that FileMaker should already have. Yeah, right. Exactly. I wish I wish Clarence would just hire Christian Schmidt and say, "Come on, put this in the real product." <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, okay. Well, we're kind of out of time. We're over our hour, so. But I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, next month, we're going to have Fred giving our presentation on uh, Linux and FileMaker Server. Yay, Fred! I'm certainly looking forward to that because I need to do some learning there. So, yep, yep. So we will get to see. How, if you want to get, find out about doing Ubuntu, the Linux stuff uh, with FileMaker and Amazon, this will certainly be a meeting to show up at, and that'll be interesting. And then, of course, the month after, uh, we'll get to learn all about uh, the new Claris Studio. So anyway, uh, any other announcements? Greg, you got any announcements for us? Greg's gone. He's there or he's on mute, but <laughs> maybe mute. on a bathroom break. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm on mute. No announcements. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for showing up and we look forward to seeing everybody uh, next month. Take Happy care. Mother's Day. Thank you, Taylor. Yeah.